Hey, I want you to listen to the audio of this video really closely. And notice if there's any difference when I do this, listening to the sound of my voice. And what about now? Am I easier to understand? The only difference is how the audio is mixed. And one of them was done entirely by AI. In this episode, we deep dive into the fundamentals of sound and mixing. And if AI could be the secret weapon for perfect audio. Do you know what mixing audio is? Like the technicalities of how it actually works. If yes, then maybe you don't need this video. But two weeks ago, I wasn't really sure. And I wanted to fix that. I know it makes the audio sound better due to frequencies or something, but how does it actually do that? And is it even worth learning if there are a bunch of AI tools that could do it for me? To understand that, we need to learn how sound works. So sound is our human interpretation of vibrations in the air. An object such as this clapperboard is closed and the energy of the movement creates a pressure wave in the air around it. That wave or change of pressure is picked up by our ears as sound. We draw this as an up and down, but it's actually an in and out motion where the frequency of the oscillations or how fast and slow the pressure of that wave is increasing and decreasing is how high or low pitched something sounds and the amplitude or how strong that pressure wave is is how loud something is. But the real world isn't simple and objects don't just create a single frequency. My voice here is creating multiple waves at higher and lower frequencies and higher and lower amplitudes. Listen to this. If we take the 200 to 500 range, you can really only hear the bassy tones in my voice. In the 2500 to 5000 range, you can hear more of the breathy upper tones and upper tone. But we need a good amount of the range that my voice is creating in order to understand me. And according to this paper, the But let's take this a step further. What if we have multiple sources of audio? Right now in this video, we've got my voice and the backing track. And although my voice is more important, we want to hear both of them at once. The crazy thing is, your ears aren't actually picking up multiple waves from these sources. You only have one eardrum per ear, so it's only getting one pressure reading at once. But something like 20,000 times a second. All of the waves are constantly adding and subtracting from each other, interfering and creating a complex single wave that your brain can then take and isolate as different sounds. And it's using frequency, amplitude, and the temporal nature of a sound, or what the sound is doing over time. And this is where it gets interesting for us. What if we have two sounds playing at the same time at roughly the same frequency and we want to hear both of them? So in this track we have our bass stem and our drum stem, represented by our lights on the left and right. But they overlap pretty heavily around the 1.5 kHz range, making them kind of hard to distinguish. By cutting some of the 1.5 range in the bass with an EQ, we can still hear the fundamental sound of the instrument, while reducing some of the frequencies that compete with the snare drum. Now this analogy isn't perfect because light and sound work a bit differently when it comes to how they combine. But from everything I've read, the subtraction of competing frequencies is kind of the core of what mixing is about. By removing some frequencies that aren't core to a sound, we can make room for other sounds to be perceived. And sure, that's easy enough when we're dealing with two lights, but how does that translate to sound and the real world? If you're lost on how to actually do that, so am I. So we're gonna get some help from a professional. With mixing specifically, it's all about taking really well done source materials and balancing them to accentuate their sort of cinematic feel in a piece. This is Alex Knickerbocker. He works on sound recording and mixing for a bunch of the major studios and also has a YouTube channel where he breaks down and teaches these same techniques. YouTube audio is, is kind of different from a lot of the bigger facility workflows, but I would say all the same basic steps apply. You want to get good clean dialogue recorded. Once you have dialogue in, it's all about making it as listenable as possible. So any weird clicks or pops or plosives or sibilance, you wanna clean that stuff up because at the end of the day, you want your audience to be able to sit down, watch whatever you're making and not think, oh, my ears are bleeding. Addressing things like that is a big, big part of this, as well as using an EQ, for example, to remove frequencies in your voice that maybe you don't like or are a little bit harsh. That's what EQ is all about, is shaping and sculpting your sound to be as pleasant as possible to the ear. Another big part of YouTube videos specifically is music balance. Honestly, there's no real formula for it yet to get it right. It all is by ear. Is your dialogue intelligible? Did you clear the music enough by lowering it or by carving out certain frequencies with an EQ or maybe both? Especially when it comes to like EQ and carving out frequencies, how does that differ from just 
turning down the volume of the background music and calling it a day. One of my favorite sayings in working with audio is that every knob is a fader. Now, a fader, if you've seen those large format consoles, is literally just a giant level adjustment line. It's, it's all about raising volume up or down. You can think of an EQ as very frequency specific faders. They're literally just turning certain parts of a sound up and down. I hadn't even thought of it from that perspective. So with all that knowledge and a healthy dose of optimism, I decided to try learn how to mix videos by myself. I found this course on Udemy called How to EQ Anything, which was helpful even though it was about music, not video, and went through all the basics on how and why we EQ. But most importantly, it helped me understand the difference between what a bad and good mix sounds like when it comes to music. And with all our audio sources in, it looks like we can do a basic three-step process. Number one, EQing each mic so it sounds good, removing any particularly harsh frequencies or rumble. Two, compression, which evens out how loud a track is so it stays a consistent volume. And three, reducing competing or masking frequencies with an EQ on the music track, which for me seems to be around the 1K range. So I'm a few hours into my course and DaVinci has just updated with a whole bunch of new AI tools that apparently are gonna fix my audio, which kind of has me thinking, what if everything I'm learning is pointless and AI can just do a better job? So we're making this a competition. I'm gonna try and mix a scene with my week of knowledge, and we're gonna put this up against two competitors. The DaVinci AI voice isolator and dialogue leveler, which are gonna clean up and process the dialogue. And then we also have Adobe Audition's auto mix, which is going to mix and duck the scene from a vocal and music stem we provide it. I'm giving that to six of the team at Syrup Lab to see which one they think sounds the best. Whether I'm in the gear room or down by the street where there's definitely a bunch more noise, I still have great sounding audio. Whether I'm in the gear room or down by the street where there's definitely a bunch more noise, I still have great sounding audio. Whether I'm in the gear room or down by the street where there's definitely a bunch more noise, I still have great sounding audio. Hmm. Just one more time. The first one definitely has a lot more sibilance to it. Actually, I can feel it like hitting my ears. Out of every single one, I'd probably say two was my favorite. It was easy differentiation between the music and the, the vocals. Three sounds like quite loud and, and just like harsh. Especially in the in the outside part, there's a lot of noise and, and rumble and cars and all that stuff. Probably number two. Yeah, it's just the cleanest. I think that's that's what describes it. So it looks like I am not going to be winning this round. Um, I'm beating Adobe Audition, but DaVinci is winning every single round. And I think the problem is noise. So outside there was a lot of car and wind noise, and I didn't learn really how to remove that. I focused on mixing clean audio sources. It just so happens that that noise removal is what the DaVinci AI is really great at. So I'm going to have to concede and give it to the AI on this round. But we're also going to do a second test, one that's a little bit more real world realistic. We're going to do DaVinci's processed audio and then compare that against the processed audio with my EQ on top of it, and we'll see which one sounds better. Whether I'm in the gear room or down by the street where there's definitely a bunch more noise, I still have great sounding audio. Whether I'm in the gear room or down by the street where there's definitely a bunch more noise, I still have great sounding audio. Okay, so this is a hard one for me, to be honest. Oh, I don't know. I, I can't tell the difference there. In the studio parts, kind of all sounded really good to me. Four was just well balanced and I think five was just a little too much emphasis on, on the voice itself. I prefer number five because the voice is way better isolated. I find the separation a little bit better between the vocals and the sound, as well as I like the sound of the dialogue more, which would be the big effect there. Maybe five sounds a bit better. They both sound fine to me. Yes, can't really notice too much of a difference. They're basically at that point where it could just be different tastes. Yeah. So, yeah, this is no way a representative or fair test, but I did find it interesting that the reviews were all over the place. And it really reminded me of what Alex said about different people having different tastes. Your tastes and sensibilities and how something should sound may be 180 degrees out from what I think something should be like. And the stuff that you're gonna pick on that you like and you want more of, I may sit there and go, how can you listen to that? I don't wanna hear that ever again. It's gonna be this totally different subjective experience. You can't qualify to one of these AIs, hey, make me something that's great. AI is probably strongest right now for the audio pipeline at a little bit of data management stuff, but also in the world of audio cleanup. If you 
have a poorly recorded piece of audio that you're trying to get the dialogue to sound a little bit more clear or you have a lot of noise going on or something like that. AI tools can help people who really don't know anything about audio restoration get something that's passable out of something that was utter garbage before. So what does this mean for our mixing process? While tools can help speed up the grunt work of the process, I still think there's value in training your ears, knowing what you like the sound of, and what creates that sound. Because even if you no longer need to do all the minute work, you're going to be better at instructing the smart tools on what sound we're trying to create. But even with the tools we have now, if you're on a quick turnaround or you don't really want to spend the time, maybe some noise reduction and a simple EQ is enough. And some vlogging mics, like the Wavo Pro, even have that built in. If it's good enough for Casey Neistat, it's probably good enough for me to vlog with. In terms of my workflow though, we're definitely going to be using a bunch more of the Resolve dialogue processing tools because they can really get us 80% of the way there. But the reality is, we're just scratching the surface with this video. There's a bunch of fascinating research I came across on how our brains actually process speech, and whether the quality of audio impacts how much we trust someone. I'll link a few in the comments below. But overall, I'm excited to dive in and learn more, AI assisted or not. And hey, if you are too, why not subscribe to Syrup Lab so we can keep producing more episodes of Film Science. Not sold yet? You can watch a few more episodes here. I'll catch you later.